Hi there, hello everybody, um, and welcome to the presentation for tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk tonight about um, should you test or shouldn't you test for Legionella in hot and cold water systems. Uh, and, and just as a bit of a proviso on that, this is I'm not going to talk about cooling towers and I'm not going to talk about healthcare as well, which are two totally different um, subjects as well. This is purely just going to be for hot and cold water systems that you will find in the normal um, commercial buildings. Next slide, please. And this is the one that we get, this is the things that we're actually going to talk about today, which is uh, Legionella pneumophila. Uh, this is the cause of the problem and what we really want to try and control. And um, we will go into later on, on about the monitoring as well. And it's these um, little bacteria that can cause a lot of problems if we don't detect them or we don't control them in our water systems. So next, uh, um, next slide, please. So I thought just to start with, just go over a bit of a, a background to the Legionella pneumophila history, just so that we get to an understanding of um, how it started. And uh, Legionella bacteria was first discovered um, in a large outbreak, which was uh, of an unknown respiratory disease amongst guests at the Belfield Stafford Hotel in Philadelphia. And there was a lot of people went ill inside there. In fact, there was um, 121 cases uh, were associated with this outbreak. And sadly, 34 deaths as well. And it took the, um, the company or, or the inspectors a long time to find out where this actually came from. And then eventually they did find out that it was coming from cooling towers from the top floor of the building. And it was falling out across the seat, um, street and then being sucked back into the building. And the majority of people were actually um, infected in the um, lounge area, which was the, the ground floor area. And um, it was the air conditioner or the, the ventilation system that was blowing in the bacteria from the cooling towers into that. And it was because of the convention that was there, which was an American Legion convention, um, this previously unknown um, pneumonia, form of pneumonia, became known as Legionnaire's disease. Next slide, please. So Legionnaire's disease is a potentially fatal form of pneumonia, uh, pneum pneumonia which causes Legionella and pneumophila bacteria caused by it. And the Legionella disease is also contracted by inhaling aerosol droplets around about one to three microns um, containing the actual bacteria. So that's quite small. And, and this is quite, cru you know, quite crucial when you, we're looking at um, the ways that Legionella gets into it. So large droplets of water um, can contain um, Legionella and it is unknown that it can cause it, but the majority of cases are caused by breathing in those aerosol droplets, which are really, really small in deep into the lungs. And that's what causes your um, Legionella disease. And Legionella disease can affect anybody. However, there is a higher percentage of people that are infected. And that's people over 45, smokers or heavy drinkers, people suffering from chronic respiratory disease, and anybody with an impaired immune system. And that sounds very, very similar to what we've just recently had with the COVID outbreak as well. Um, and so basically any respiratory disease can affect people of this um, stature from these areas and that. So the symptoms include a high fever, chills, headaches, coughs and breathlessness, uh, diarrhea, muscle pains, um, vomiting and dis uh, disorientation, which again is very, very similar to what many respiratory diseases can give as well. Legionella bacteria can also cause a couple of other diseases called Pontiac and Lock um head fever as well. And they're not so um, as dangerous as the Legionella itself, but they can still be very, very um, you know, dangerous to the people, especially if they have immune systems as well. Next slide, please. So Legionella's disease in the UK, um, and this is just uh, some information that's been provided by the HSE is that there is average uh, around about 250 to 500 uh, cases of Legionella's disease recorded each year in England and Wales. And there's around about death occurs in around 10 to 15 percent of those infected. And these can range from, you know, big outbreaks to people that are catching 
uh, Legionella from um, from shower heads or from systems within buildings. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be big cases that are, you know, that get into the um, media and that. There are lots of little cases that do happen with Legionella's disease. So there are, um, well, the, the main Legionella pneumophila um, stereo group is uh, one, is responsible for over 90% of the diseases within the UK. And as we'll talk a bit, a bit later on, there are all different types of sterile groups and there's up to, I've just been recently to a, um, an LCA conference. And there is now six, uh, recognised that there's now, they said there's 16 groups uh, of le different types of Legionella that's been recognised. Although there is more and more of those, there's probably around about, there's up to 60 different types of Legionella that can be found in water. The majority of Legionella disease within the UK occurs between June and October, which are normally the warmer months of um, the UK, and is an indication of how Legionella disease or Legionella pneumophila um, can breed or, or multiply in, in proper or, or certain types of water temperatures. And it's normally within the UK that we get these higher temperatures in June and October. Legionella uh, disease tends to increase, uh, well, it is increasing completely across um, the whole of the UK, um, mainly because of global, uh, global temperature rises, um, the increased use of cooling installations, improved diagnostics methods, which we'll come on to a bit later on, um, and the increase of um, elderly impaired immune system populations. So our, our populations are getting older now, so they are more likely to be affected by it. And also um, with the water safety uh, saving devices that we put in like low flows and TMVs that are installed in our systems, they provide you know, additional or ideal uh, breeding grounds for a new um, legion and a new muffler with inside our systems. And of course, uh, as we've seen through COVID-19, where a lot of our co uh, commercial buildings have had low um, occupancies, the water systems haven't been used as much, the flushing probably hasn't been carried out as good as it should be, and the increase of risk of legionnaire has increased in a lot of our buildings as well. Next slide please. So where can legionella be found? Um, legionella is actually a naturally um, occurring bacteria and it can be found in rivers and streams and lakes and in sediment and in earth. And um, it's, it's just out into the natural environment, but when it's out there, it is pretty low. And it's, it's important to understand that it is actually out in the environment, because when we do monitoring a bit later on, uh, which we'll we talk about, is, is that if, it, if your water is drawn from natural water sources, you're more likely to have Legionella than, in them than you are from mains or main supplied water. That you get into buildings so it, it is important to understand where your water supply comes from so legionella bacteria is also found in man-made water systems such as cooling towers evaporated condensers hot and cold water systems spa pools fire hoses etc basically any any water system that gets into a building has the likelihood to have legionella bacteria into it and if those conditions within those systems are favorable then the bacteria may multiply and increase the risk of Legionella's disease within that building. So it's good to get an understanding of how your building is set out as well. Next slide, next slide please. So favorable conditions. Um, these are normally within man-made systems that can increase the risk of Legionella. And uh, they normally can, uh, include water temperatures that are between 20 and 45 degrees centigrade and 37 being the optimum, and that's body temperature. Most bacteria like to um, you know, multiply and they can really get a hold of uh, the body at that temperature. Also nutrients as well. Um, if you have a dirty system or a system or pipework that is dirty or it's unclean, then you will get algae bacteria and maybe iron there from um, pipes that are rot rotten in, and Legionella will actually feed off there and that will encourage them to um, multiply as well. The environment also within inside the system, you know, sludge, sediment, scale, biofilm, corrosion and stagnant water are all favourable conditions for 
uh, Legionella to get hold of when they're actually inside your um, your building. Next slide, please. So the law, um, this is for the UK as well. I'm, I'm sure that we all know that it's Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 is the major primary law. Uh, and then we have a couple of other ones that are underneath uh, secondary um, law as well, which is your management of health and safety at work regulations. And the most important one of them all is the control of substances hazardous to health or the cost regulations. And uh, if you were to get an outbreak um, in, in uh, with Legionnaire inside a building, you would be prosecuted obviously under the Health and Safety at Work Act, but they would use the cost regulations as the one to prosecute you underneath. Um, because um, a lot of people think the cost is just purely for chemicals, but it also includes um, biological as well. Um, and there are essential elements to the cost regulations that are used in the prevention of Legionella within systems, and that is a risk assessment, uh, preventing exposure to Legionella, the control of exposure where prevention um, and maintenance, examination and testing of control measures, provision of information and instruction and training for employees and then health surveillance of the employees that's pretty difficult to do um, with legionella but it also includes techniques for detecting indications of the disease so that is monitoring so the cosh regulations are actually us you know to say about monitoring in a roundabout way next slide please so that's the law um, but we also have, to put it in practice, we've got uh, an approved code of practice, which is the uh, the ACOP L8, uh, which is the Legionnaire's disease of control of Legionella bacteria within inside this water. And that sets out um, guidance on how you should, uh, or, or guidance for preventing Legionella. But it's not very practical um, on that, that side of things. So they've got the HSG 274 Legionnaire's technical guidance, which explains a lot more on how to prevent and the control measures you should have in place for preventing Legionella. And there's three parts to that. There's part one, which looks after evaporating cooling systems. There's part two, which we are concentrating on today, which is a control of Legionella bacteria of hot, water, hot and cold water systems. And then part three is other risk systems. And that looks at different things like spas, um, cat five tanks, emergency showers, and so forth from that. So controlling Legionella, fundamental steps. Um, that is that we need to be able to do Legionella risk assessments, okay? And completing by a comp um, competent person to the relevant BS, which is BS 8580. And it's essential that we do get those risk assessments done on your buildings. And within that risk assessment, um, using the findings from the Legionella risk assessment, we have a written control scheme um, to prevent Legionella growth within inside the, the, the systems that you've got. And then we've got to make sure that we implement the control measures and monitor and record them as well. And these are all set out in HSG 274, which is the technical guidance. Next slide, slide please. The basic control measures, I'm um, just going through them quickly, are uh, temperature regimes where we want to keep cold water below 20, which will keep the bacteria stagnant. Um, hot water above 50 degrees, which will at different types of temperatures actually kill off the bacteria. We can also use biocide treatments as well, like chlorine dioxide, etc., which we can be injected into the system and they can that can control the bacteria as well. We can avoid putting water stagnation um, by keeping water flowing, avoid the materials that harbour the source of nutrients and bacteria, uh, control the release of spray water as well. So if you're spraying water everywhere, you increase the risk of the Legionella and keeping the system and the water within the system clean, which is really important as well. Next slide, please. So should we test or not test? That is the question. Um, ACOP L8 does mention about Legionella monitoring, but it's only for cooling towers. It doesn't actually mention anything about hot and cold water systems. And when you look at HSG 274, it does say in there that monitoring, a microbiology monitoring or sampling of domestic hot and cold water supplies um, from mains water is not usually required. 
So you don't really need to do the testing. However, okay, um, that's that's the big question. When should you do them? Well, HSG 274 is very clear uh, when you do say that. So if we go to the next slide, please. So what it's saying is that you should uh, carry out Legionella monitoring sampling should be carried out when there is doubt about the efficiency of the control regime or it is known that the recommended temp temperatures, disinfection concentrations or other precautions have, are not being consistently achieved throughout the system. So we just mentioned earlier on in a couple of slides before about those controls that we need to have in place. So if any of those controls are failing or we're not maintaining, keeping those controls going, or that we're getting a drop in temperature or the disinfection is not getting around the system, then HSG 274 is saying that you should carry out some monitoring on top of that as well. But also um, sampling for Legionella should be routinely conducted if identified by the Legionella risk assessment. The person doing the risk assessment may turn around and say because of the, the way that the system is or the condition of the system or what is found in that risk assessment, we should do a monitoring of the system. And as I said before on there, the suspect or identified cases of Legionella disease. So if we know that there has been a suspected or identified case or outbreak of Legionella within that system, then we should be doing routine monitoring on that as well. But I think what most people do as well, just as a belt and braces approach uh, to risk management, they have the actual um, monitoring done regardless on that one, which is not a bad thing. It does give you an understanding if your control measures are working, um, but you know, um, it, it's there just to, um, for reassurance um, to make sure we haven't got that Legionella in that system. Next slide, please. So the different types of testing. There is, uh, there's, there's three, currently three different types of methods of testing. The first one is the gold, uh, is the culture method, and this is the gold standard. This is what is recognised by the HSE uh, as being the, 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 you know, the gold standard of actually uh, monitoring for Legionella. And samples are connect, uh, collected in pre-sterilised polyphane containers and sent to a UCAS accredited uh, laboratory. And from that, they can do these culture slides, which you can see on the picture there, and they can actually identify the CFUs or how many there are within inside or forming units within that culture. And they can also um, identify the particular type of species of Legionella as well. So those, uh, those sterile groups from one to 16 or one to 15, if you're depending on you, what regulations you're looking at. Um, they can understand how what type they are. Remember, one is the one that is most deadly, but they also can tell you if it falls into the other categories or if it's a different type of um, legion as well. They're all as dangerous as each other, so you know they're no less dangerous and no less that you can't uh, don't, shouldn't take down, um, action on. So the next um, slide, please. So the next one is the PCR method. Um, now we've all heard about PCR through our COVID days, um, and this is uses a DNA extraction to identify the Legionella. Uh, the results are normally within two days, however, the method is traditionally more expensive. Now, we do use this um, on our monitoring as well. And what normally happens is that we take the culture method by filling up a container, and then we ask for a DNA extraction to be done at the same time. So they do the two tests hand in hand, but we do get um, results within about two days. However, um, it does require specialist equipment and the results can be difficult to in interpret. And what it does do, it, instead of actually providing um, the level of Legionella uh, within the system that HSG 274 asks for, which they give um, set limits for what you should be doing, and they give that in CFUs, the uh, PCR method only gives out un un dramatic um, units per litre. Okay, so it's it's n HSG 274 at the moment doesn't tell you what to look for on that. HSG 274 has been out for about 10 years now, and they are currently writing amendments to it. And one of those amendments will be more information about the PCR method as well, and they will give us more guidance on that. So that should be really good, um, you know, and it, I 
think they're trying to publish it around about this time next year. Next slide, please. So the last method um, is a rapid swab method, which again is something that we've seen from our COVID days. And these are very much like those um, little test kits that we used to get where we um, take the sample and we um, put it in the jug and then we put it onto the actual test slide and it will tell you whether there is legionnaire there. However, it will only tell you if there's sterile group one in there. It will not tell you whether there are any other types of legionella in there, um, which is good to see whether it's you know the, the most uh, uh, deadliest one of it, but it won't tell you if you've got legionella of any other type in there. And it's not really there for robust um, testing of um, water systems. And it's not UCAS accredited either, which doesn't conform to what we, you know, what the HSG 274 wants as well. But it is good just to, um, you know, test and see whether there is or isn't any of the um, top, you know, the number one sterile group as well. So if you'd like to next slide, please. So ACOP uh, L8 requires analysis, uh, analysis of water samples for legionnaire to be completed by UCAS accredited. Um, laboratory using the IS standard and that's the 11731 and these methods are used to actually um, find out what uh, the uh, legion ladder is and it will give you in CFUs per litre and it will also give you the sterile groups between 1 to 16. Legion analysis sampling should be conducted in accordance to the BS relevant BS standard and this is just changed this year so if you've got an old copy of the old um, system, which I believe is um, 2012, I believe it was, it is worth looking at it. There are some fundamental changes that they put in there for the sampling of Legionnaire, especially if you're doing Legionnaire sampling yourself. Um, in, and the industry best practice for routine Legionella sampling is completed around about every quarter uh, or every three months. Um, and this is what we do on our system. We, we, we routinely sample our buildings on every three month over a 12 month period. Next slide, please. So routine Legionella as well, uh, as I just touched on there before, we actually do all our Legionella sampling ourselves and um, we've got trained technicians um, that uh, are competent in taking samples and they will take it in the appropriate um, the containers, they write out the submission forms and they will take, send it and take it to a laboratory and then we get our samples back on um, within, normally within about 10 to 14 days, we will get a indication whether there's legion over there. It's always best to have a task risk assessment for your um, sampling as well, like any risk assessment, there are risks, well any task we do, there are risks in doing it. So it's important that you do have a risk assessment for sampling. And also a sampling plan as well, um, especially if you're routinely sampling, it just as a belts and braces side of things, it is good to have a, a sampling plan which identifies where these samples should be taken and the type of samples uh, and the frequency and the methods used on that. And this is normally displayed in a simple matrix and that. So what I try and do is over the four quarters, is I try to get a sample from each location, um, Sentinels uh, outlets, um, nearest and furthest, cold water storage tanks to do, which are all the high end. Um, and then in between, we take um, uh, samples as per the plan um, over the course of 12 months. Next um, slide, please. So as I touched earlier on, cleaning uh, and maintenance is very, is crucial um, and again, this is something where you know we can do the routine um, uh, monitoring as well. If we get places like this, uh, and we can identify some areas which haven't been cleaned, that haven't been maintained as per HSG 274, and there's a couple on there, shower head there. Um, I've seen them less than this, uh, less um, sure um, calcium around outlets like this, and still have Legionella in them. As well so it is crucial that you do maintain your systems and keep them clean. Um, the top uh, right hand one there is a flexi hose um, and this has to be a, you know, a water approved uh, flexi hose or what happens is that you get the, the slime building up or a, a biofilm building up in there and you will get your um, legionella feeding off of that. 
and uh, the bottom one there with all the pink stuff at the bottom there that is what's taken out of a diffuser on a tap and uh, you will get uh, legionella bacteria sitting in there as well as other bacteria so it is crucial that you do clean your systems next slide please and this is just a couple of examples of what we do i touched on earlier on um, when they were talking about tmvs being a, a probably a cause of the increase of uh, legionella and this is what we definitely find is that when we take over a building and we're doing our inspections is that um, TMVs have not been cleaned properly they've not been stripped down and this is normally the cause for legionella with, from the outlet and as you can see the one on the the left side there you can see a lot of calcium build up you can see a lot of um, foreign bodies in there as well um, and it needs to be properly cleaned and properly stripped down right out and that's what's happening on the right side there and these are photographs that are taken by our water techs to um, prove that we've actually done this as well and the bottom one there is a diffuser that's been taken apart as well just squeeze you know squirting um, uh, disinfecting up inside the outlet doesn't do it uh, you need to strip these things down and you need to make sure that they are clean and it does take time but if you keep your system clean, keep all your parts clean, you reduce, really do reduce your chances of Legionella on your systems. And next slide, please. Probably the last, uh, this is the last slide, but probably the most important as well, is make sure that you keep your uh, records and your documentation up to date. And there's two examples there, is our hot cold water storage distribution temperatures. Um, where we are going through taking our chlorophyll temperatures, we're taking our sentinel temperatures, and then we do uh, temperatures across the whole of the building um, at different interviews, intervals and to ensure that we have got those hot water temperatures are reaching those outlets. Um, and, and just as importantly is when we do find non-conformities is to write them down, log them on the sheet, and then take action to do that. Because if you don't, if you don't do this, and you haven't logged them down and you can't demonstrate that you are trying to maintain the temperatures as a control regime and you've identified non-conformities and you've not done something about it and someone catches Legionella then this is when you would be open to prosecution on that one so record keeping it is extremely important and also a part of that would be the documentation for all the samples that you've taken showing where you've taken them from and showing that with your sample plan that you have carried out monitoring across the whole of the building. I believe that's the last slide, Julia. Okay, we haven't had any questions in yet. So okay. if you've got anything else that you want to tell us and to tell, give people a chance to ask questions, or maybe everybody's shy this evening. So, um, anybody has got a question, now's your time to type it into the questions box. So I can't tell whether there's anything coming in yet, so I don't know whether you've got any top tips to leave us with, Kevin. Well, your top tips on, you know, for preventing Legionella is making sure that you maintain the, you know, you maintain your system, you do the, the control measures that are set out in HSG 274, table 2.1. Um, they're very, very clear on what they, they stay there. And they, you know, if you're doing it on a temperature regime, then you've got to make sure that your temperatures are reaching those temperatures that are set out. Um, you know, and that is for stored water above 60 degrees, for outlet um, temperatures for above 50 within one minute. Uh, and then also um, with cold water temperatures as well. And that is cold, um, cold storage temperatures below 20. Uh, and outlet temperatures below 20 within two minutes. If you are in London and um, or in big buildings uh, or, or, or big built up areas in the summer months, which we identified earlier on between June and October, where we have you know higher temperatures, uh, incoming water coming into your mains, water coming into your storage tanks or actually coming into your building will be majority of the time above 20 not a lot you can do about it to be honest with you um, unless you put cooling systems in but um, you've got to be able to take action and um, um, and actually log those down as non-conformities and and put in your uh, your remedial actions that you're going to do what we've done with ours because of the low occupancy on a lot of our buildings that we look after we reduced the level of the tank water 
where you've even in some cases turned around and saying, well, you don't need to have cold water storage tanks. There is no need to have them. Um, and if you can, you know, agree on a, you know, the risk that you don't need to have it, take your cold water storage tanks. It just eliminates again one source of um, an area where Legionella can breed. TMVs is probably the, you know, and from my experience, is probably the the place where you will find Legionella uh, because people haven't uh, cleaned and maintained them properly. Uh, and that's normally, in, as I said, in our experience when we go into new buildings, is that we um, we do the sample and we find out where the Legionella is um, and the control measures haven't been put in place. It is essential that you do this. Cleaning showers as well. Um, as I said, I went to an LCA conference and they, they had a HSE inspector there and they were talking about a shower outlet where a maintenance company hadn't cleaned them and someone caught Legionella. And um, because they hadn't cleaned the shower outlets correctly, uh, and they came up with all different excuses why they hadn't done it, but obviously weren't satisfactory because they ended up getting prosecuted for it. So it is really essential that you maintain and you carry out these control measures to, um, you know, to HS274. Legionella monitoring is only going to tell you whether there's Legionella there and whether your control measures are, you know, are effective. But just by monitoring is not going to stop you getting Legionella. You need to put in all the hard work behind that about maintaining temperatures, maintaining um, uh, back to, I would say, um, chemical regimes and making sure that you're cleaning and maintaining your system. That's, that's the key. Great. And I'm nodding at you here, realising no one can actually see me nodding as you're speaking. So it must be quite disconcerting that you get no feedback at all. We do have two questions in now. Um, so the first one is from Ray. So this is a two part question. I'll try and do it justice. I sometimes fluff up reading long questions. What are the requirements for flushing washing machines, toilets and mains fed drinking water machines, please? And water and water about safety regarding out um, I think it meant to be and what about safety regarding outdoor water fountains and water butts can you clarify requirements please thank you right okay um good questions actually um because I think the, the subject that you've just spoken about is a lot of people do um you know completely forget about those and then like any it's like a washing machine as well um they are um like any other outlet um if they are not used um, the pipe work that goes to that washing machine will become stagnant. Um, it will become a, a, a blind end. Um, it's not being used. So if you've got a washing machine that is uh, redundant and it's not um, going to be used for any length of time, and that's normally what HSG 274 says, it mentions about flushing in two areas um, inside those, um, those uh, that technical guidance. So one said that you should flush for several minutes. And the other one says that you should flush until the temperatures are stable. Um, so if you have got a washing machine that's connected and you're not using it, the best thing would be to do is disconnect that so that you can flush that out there um, every every week because it is an infrequently used outlet on that one. So you would have to add that to your infrequently used outlet list and then um, flush it from there. Toilets as well, toilet systems, again, they are supplied by mains water. And if you've got a building that people are not using the toilets, that pipe work that goes up to the system where the ball cock all the way back to where it comes onto the mains, again, is another um, potentially blind end. And if it's not being flushed on a regular basis and that water is not moving, you are then providing ideal conditions for Legionella to start stagnating, or start producing because the water is stagnating. Plus also, you know, majority of um, pipe work that um, sits in rises and so forth like that, if it's, if it's not insulated correctly, then it will get heat transmission and you will get temperatures rising above 20 degrees. Or if um, on the, you know, with hot water, if they're not insulated, you'll drop them below um, 12 as well. Going on to fit, um, features, uh, water features and so forth, they're normally covered in section three of the HSG 274. And again, um, it all depends whether your water fish in it, the features got water uh, fish in it. So if it has, you don't want to be putting any biohazards in uh, your bio treatments into that, so that kill the fish off. Um, and off the top of my head, I can't really think about um, what you would do in that circumstances. 
the water features that we uh, maintain in courtyards, they have um, a biocide that's put into the system and that is checked on a regular basis. Um, from a, We normally do that out through a contractor because it is a specialised um, maintenance and that, but they will have a biocide going through there to prevent any, any type of bacteria growing as well. But Thank you. Do you know, I, I would never have thought of washing machines and toilets. I just think drinking water and... Yeah, I think, mean, you know, that is... A lot of people do think that. But you've got to think this is hot and cold water systems. You know, and cold water systems and hot water systems do connect to washing machines and that. Your drinking fountains, which I just remembered on that one there, if they're plugged into the into the mains, again, if they're not being used, potentially they are, for all intents and purposes, a blind end. And if you're not using them, they should be decommissioned and then they should be flushed. The, the pipe work should be flushed. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it doesn't matter whether they come out of a drinking tap or it's connected to a piece of machinery. It's the same principle. Yeah. Yeah. So, is it, do you, so with um, the new ways of working, kind of hybrid working, and maybe offices only opening so, so many days a week, is that causing extra risks of having less people in in the office? And yeah, it, it does because you will get majority of buildings are but all buildings are built for you know main capacity um, with, with people in there. So if you take say a toilet um, which may have three cubicles, it may have four sinks. Uh, in there, if you've got uh, high occupancy, you may have that people, you know, going in and out all at a time, and they're using yeah. hopefully all of the sinks at the time. When you have a low occupancy, that those people will go. Only human behaviour is, and humans are being lazy that they, you know, they do take the shortest route. They will go to the cubicle. They will do that. They will go to the nearest sink. And if you've got four sinks in a row, uh, and the furthest sinks away from the cubicle that they use at the time that end uh, sink yep. will become potentially will become a blind end which is an unused outlet which will allow um, legionella bacteria or give the conditions for legionella bacteria to breed so very you know, interesting you have got to, one of the you know one of the fundamental things that we found even through the height the shutdown we had engineers that would go in and they would flush and flush and flush uh, because we just didn't have that movement of water within the building. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we've got one um, one more question. One question from Tony, and then a bit of extra advice from Ray, whose question you've just a answered. Right. So from Tony, thank you, Kevin. Information has been seen recently for checks at a spa. Do you have any advice for a spa? Yes. Um, yeah, that's going to be covered under Section 3 of HSG or, or Part 3 of HSG 274. Um, and off the top of my head, I, I couldn't really answer that one. I've not really got involved in spas themselves um, because of the nature of where they are um, and because of the they normally have treatments in there um, for people to go and bathe in and so forth and that. Um, so we, we normally have specialist help to come out and do that. So uh, okay. on spas, yeah, I, I really couldn't. Um, I would yeah. have to take some guidance on that. Yeah, I'd rather you say that than feel, you know, yeah. feel pressured into answering a question. Um, so the last question is from Ray. Um, so he asked the previous question. So he's mm -hmm. asking now about water butts, please. Risks and management advice, if you wouldn't mind. Water butts, what, as in, um, you know, like a garden water butt um, that's full up with water. Now, if they're right. not connected to the mains, okay, um, then you know there's no chance of the going back onto, um, you know, back into the system. But it's like anything, uh, you know, one of the one of the uh, ways that lead, well, the, the way that leads, you know, it gets into the body is through aerosol droplets. Now, if you're using that water butt to fill up a um, a watering can and you're watering you your garden yes. with it, yeah. So the the, the chances of legionella affecting you are going to be really low um i'm not saying it's it's not um because there has been cases where people have apparently caught legionella from ice cubes but um you know that I'm, but i'm not that i can confirm that uh, but if you you know there have been chances of people just taking legionella into their body you know into their mouth and getting it but um the highest risk is from aerosol um, and if you're not generating an aerosol from that water butt, 
uh, and reducing it like from a um, you know on a hose or so forth the chances are, are going to be really really remote you know? but garden hoses again if you've got a garden hose that's set in the heat and you've not used it for a long time and it's had water sit sitting in there and then suddenly you decide to spray you know everywhere and you've generated that spray and the aerosol then yeah you, know, you do increase your risk um, of legionella Great, thank you. That was a very comprehensive answer and some very difficult questions. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much for giving up your time to present yes. this evening's webinar, as, as well as being on the Southeast Branch Committee. Um, I know I kind of arm wrestled you into this one, but I think it's been very worthwhile and I'm sure everyone yes. enjoyed it this evening. Being my first um, ever webinar, it was quite fun. No, and it was excellent. So I'll be calling on you for some more webinars. <laughs> right, I'd like to thank everybody for attending um, this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, we hope to see you at the next Southeast Branch webinar. Um, just to remind you that your attendance certificates will come out automatically and they'll come out this time tomorrow. So I'd like to wish everybody a good evening and hope to see you at a webinar soon. Good night, everyone. Good night.